Hello everyone and welcome to the 5G Word Manufacturing Panel. My name is Sylvia Liu and I'm the Head of the Technology Strategy at New Blocks and a co-chair of the UK 5G Manufacturing Working Group. I'll be the moderator of this panel discussion on smart manufacturing and 5G. Now, we know that Industry 4.0 and 5G present opportunities for enormous economy and productivity gains, especially in the area of smart manufacturing. Today, we're going to get the latest insights from the experts working at the 5G manufacturing testbed and tri projects in the UK, Germany and Sweden. We have representatives from the Factory of the Future, Westfield and 5G digital catapults and 5G smart. And we're going to reflect on the learnings of the tries, the difficulties encountered, and most importantly, the real benefits of 5G uh, could bring to the manufacturing sector. Without further ado, let me introduce our four distinguished panelists. That's Cathy Ho, Head of Innovation Practice at Digital Catapults, Joachim Sachs, Senior Expert from Ericsson, Ricardo Weber, Project Manager from WM5G, last but not least, Siva Aparajithan, uh, Program Lead of the 5G Factory of the Future at the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center. So welcome all everyone. Now, Ricardo, um, could we start with you? So WM5G has been the pioneer in trialing 5G technologies in the manufacturing sectors in the UK. How will 5G add value to the manufacturing sector? Can you give some examples and what are the difficulties encountered during the trials? Okay, um, thank you, Fabia. Um, I tend to look at the value added always from a use case perspective. I think having the use case right to start with, understanding what you really want to achieve is absolutely critical because only then you can value and measure the value actually of what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think a key value that we're trying to achieve is to improve true productivity. So the quantity as well as the quality of things and trying to measure that obviously. Um, we're also starting to establish a standard set of use cases which add more value than possibly the whole variety of use cases that are out there. So we're looking, we're starting to look at the core of use cases that we can use to really add most of the value. Um, examples on that would be around monitoring and optimizing processes. So this is, this is really about lifetime analysis of processes, what's happening in the process right now while it's running rather than waiting until it's finished and analyzing data afterwards. Um, we're having that in one of our trials at a aerospace that we're using. Another thing that we're doing there is a second use case all around real life tracking of assets. So knowing the status of an asset at any given time and also at movable with movable assets is knowing where they are um, and finding them quicker and being able to save time there. So it's, it's really all about hands-on time savings, productivity improvements and, and yeah, making a huge difference there that is measurable. Um, difficulties in the trials, to come to your second question, I mean, mostly they're, they're R&D programs. So there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, we had a few smaller issues with the network deployment, configuration of the networks, which is all sorted now. Um, also the availability of equipment can be difficult in the early stages now, but I think that is improving. So it's, it's very much, all about the team working together and optimizing the process of it and what we're doing there. Um, more fundamental difficulties that we've actually faced is the different parties, what I would call speaking the same language. And I'm not talking about English and other languages, I'm talking about the language of manufacturers, the language of system integrators, the language that MNOs might speak. And there's potential for a lot of misunderstanding between them. And, and I think this is, this is a big learning, really listening in and, and, and understanding what a manufacturer says and why he or she says it. And um, also the expectations, especially with SMEs, is what can they do? And especially what can't they do? What is not within their reach of capabilities to understand that better? 
very um, very obvious one that we have that we didn't think about, but also with the Ofcom licensing, that is something we, we need to possibly improve a little bit. But again, this is why we're doing these trials to understand how we can optimize that. Um, and don't start trials in a global pandemic. That really makes things difficult. I mean, it wasn't something that we picked to do, but just visiting sites and, and looking at things and bringing people together to discuss things was really, really difficult. Um, but again, that's not really something you can do about, but, but taking the learnings away, what worked with us working remotely, what didn't work with us. Um, I think that that sums up the most difficulties. So, yeah. That's really brilliant. Thank you for your insights. Um, so certainly we're going to discuss a lot bit more later. Uh, now, Siva, if I can, you are heavily involved in the DCMS, the government funded 5G factory of the future, test band and tries. What are the primary drivers for the manufacturing adopting 5G? Could you describe some of the takeaway or key, you know, key aspects of 5G uh, factory of the future is enabling that for the manufacturers? Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I will follow on from what Ricardo just started. Um, so 5G factory of the future project has a major role to play or the, the main motive of the project is to understand what's 5G's position or 5G's place within manufacturing. Is it going to be replacing a, you know, a wired connectivity or a wireless connectivity? Or is it much more than that? Do, what, what, is, what is it going to change? Is it going to, is it going to make a big difference? Uh, is it going to change the whole landscape, bringing new opportunities and all? In theory, yeah, we heard all of those things, but we wanted to prove it uh, within the manufacturing context. That's, that's our main motive of this program. Um, again, like, um, it's, it's a really nice uh, thing you mentioned, Ricardo, you, the, the languages. This is, this is something we, we wanted to experience through the, throughout the project. Because without knowing these problems, we have like computational companies, we have telecoms companies, we have manufacturers. All of these people talk completely different languages, and I, I I can't explain any more than like you know how how much time we spent on single word, not understanding each other, not talking about the same thing. Um, one of the other thing is about you know there are a variety of companies. Um, a smaller size ones, five man company, one man company, two, um, you know, reasonable 50, you know, growing companies, SME range. And the other ones are like the tier one companies, uh, larger aircraft builders, shipbuilders, and all. Is 5G gonna address the problems in the same way for all of these companies, or is it all different? So, so what we are trying to understand throughout this project, how different models are going to be available for different, um, you know, SMEs or like the tier ones, and also different applications through the use cases. The use cases across the world remain pretty similar, even though you know they are they are slightly different. There are some smaller, you know, tweaks about it. The use cases are pretty similar. The 5G offers ultra low latency, high bandwidth, you know, controllable traffic, um, you know, traffic controls and all of them, guaranteed security and all. So the use cases tend to fall into the same area. However, different models of 5G, like, you know, um, is it going to be a private installation? Is it going to be an MNO uh, based installation? Or is it going to use a public network? So all of these things are going to be different for different um, different types of our companies, and so our motive through the five G factory of the future project is is to expose all of them to get some experience um, through all of these channels. Um, that that's what we are trying here. So I think at the end of the program, the the, the actual takeaway will be everyone will be able to understand what what really involves. Um, going through the 5G transformation journey. Um, what, what, is, what, what are the problems we will have? Who are the stakeholders we will need to involve? Um, again, like a skill development, you know, we, we do have lots of IT skills, uh, electronics and all of them. But then when you put together lots of different trades like telecoms, um, uh, 
um, IT infrastructures and manufacturing automations and all of it. Uh, that's a new, new landscape. So what are the new opportunities coming down um, through the 5G rollout? For example, one of the really good thing is like the cloud, the concept of cloud has changed now within, within our, you know, our, our organization, our, our consortium in the 5G project. So say for example, we, we were using IBM cloud, we were using Azure, my, you know, Amazon and all. The 5G is literally bring those clouds very close to the factory floor. So 5G enables you to do that. So our perception on cloud has significantly changing these days. So these are the new, you know, paradigm shifts we are looking through the 5G rollout. That's really interesting. Thank you very much, Siva. Uh, now to, you know, for our SMEs, to the big ones, uh, Joachim. So Ericsson certainly is one of the leaders in developing 5G in the industrial sectors, and you are leading uh, several research projects in relation to the manufacturing sector, like the European Commission funded program 5G Smart, which are, we are also a partner. Uh, could you highlight some of the key use cases and outcome of the project so far and what the key learnings? Yes, of course. Thanks, Sylvia. So, I, I mean, in general, manufacturing is really in a transformation. And this is enabled by um, the digital toolbox that was developed in the ICT industry during the last 10, 15 years. And now it's about how exploring the opportunities that this brings to manufacturing. And that is what we investigate then in the 5G Smart Project by having built three 5G trial systems for manufacturing. And um, to start with the first one, so in the, we, we have an Ericsson factory where we look into how industrial robotics can be transformed by 5G and the edge cloud. And this we do together with ABB. So we look into how can we have new ways of collaboration among robots, between robots and human operators, and enhancing how um, robot control, for example, can be enhanced with uh, cloud-enabled machine vision. And really the, uh, the cloud computing provides yeah, a lot of benefits. It provides uh, low cost scalable computing. It's consistently upgraded. It has the latest state of the art and it exceeds the capabilities that exist with the embedded computing that is um, traditionally used. And, um, and then of course we come to this edge cloud. So being able to, uh, to um, deploy the computing um, locally we can have performance, privacy, and high availability. And then 5G is the glue which connects the cloud to the, um, to the robot. And this is so together, the 5G in combination with the edge cloud is really the opportunity here that we investigate. And as with the other trials as well, what we heard before, I mean, there is this, um, the vision that everybody sees of the potential, but when we come into the details, um, it's, writing something in a white paper and really understanding what it really means. You have to put, uh, get dirty hands and see how it works uh, in real. And that's why we do the trials. In another um, trial, we, um, uh, we, we look into local deployability of 5G in a, a semiconductor factory of Bosch. And there the 5G performance is validated now in a very demanding real life factory environment. And here we also look into how we can manage a fleet of mobile robots controlled and coordinated from a cloud and how we can bring in industrial control to control communication over 5G, make it wireless, providing new flexibility. Um, so what is the benefit of uh, being able to remove cables and, um, and, and getting the uh, flexibility in customizing the uh, shop floor setup. In the uh, third trial that we have, we uh, look into real-time workpiece monitoring during machining. So for example, in a milling process, and this we do with the Fraunhofer Institute for Production Technology. And here we have several other partners like Ublox for the, the devices, Marpos for industrial sensors, and IPT in looking into these new machining solutions. So here we want to do real-time monitoring of what is happening on the workpiece during the milling, feeding this into the cloud again, where data analysis is made for detecting if some um, 
surface de um, defects are appearing during the uh, milling process for steering the process at, as it is ongoing. And um, so all of those look into the usage of these new technologies like um, cloud for computing, machine learning for anal analytics of the data, 5G for providing the connectivity. And what it needs is that we need open standards for deterministic, high performance, dependable communication that enable to bring this all together. And that is what we really um, look into. 5G does this for wireless, TSN does the same for the fixed ethernet. So how to bring this all together into a system setup, this is what we um, investigate. And 5G brings the flexibility in deployment. And then of course, has a lot of benefits when it comes to mobility like mobile robots. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Joachim. And um, from what I heard so far, great synergy between different projects, um, whether that's process monitoring or the benefits demonstrating, so cloud, et cetera, we heard a lot. And now, um, last but not least, Cathy. Um, so Digital Catapults is playing a key role in several 5G test ban tries projects in the UK, and you're heading innovation and acceleration program on 5G. Um, and in also relation to what Ricardo and Siva mentioned of supporting SMEs on their 5G journey, can you give some examples of what Digital Capital is doing on that, on that aspect? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, so, you know, at Digital Catapult, we identify a couple of barriers, really, for SMEs to start experimenting with 5G. And it starts with actually understanding of the key capabilities of 5G and what that is, what opportunities that provides um, for the startup themselves, um, and also what are some of the use cases where they could really add value. So um, we support both kind of 5G startups, but also a majority of the startups we support are companies working in advanced digital technology who can really leverage um, the benefits of 5G to further develop their products and services. So we've designed um, our acceleration program, um, which we first ran in London and Brighton, which helps startups firstly to identify what are the relevant use cases where they can really add value, um, help them understand um, you know, what where they can really develop these use cases further. So um, we give them access to our test beds, um, to technical expertise, to help them you know, test performances, but also to further develop their 5G roadmap. And then on the other hand, we also help them to understand, you know, now that you have an understanding of how you can leverage 5G, what is your business value proposition? So how can you, um, you know, pitch to industry um, what your value proposition is now with the 5G capabilities that you have developed to drive value. So um, we ran you know, commercial accelerators as well in partnership with Ericsson and with industrial partners and SMEs really bring the supply and demand side together to build business cases to take forward some of these innovations. Um, we're of course part of a consortium member for um, Spring, which is the commercial application accelerator partnership with West Midlands 5G, which is actually delivering um, this type of acceleration at scale because ambition is to support you know, over 100 SMEs and startups um, across the UK to develop commercially viable um, proof of concepts or prototypes that they can then take forward um, for you know, MVP or any kind of commercial partnerships. And um, you know, the themes that we're exploring there are manufacturing, tra transport, logistics, construction, just to name a few. Um, and some of the use cases that we're looking at, um, you know, again, aligns with what other panelists have already mentioned around remote operations, asset tracking, um, machine time servitization, worker assistance, um, remote monitoring and um, real time as well. So on this program, what we're looking at is SMEs um, and startups that work in AI, work in computer vision, they work in, you know, immersive um, technologies. Um, that can really leverage and benefit from the capabilities of 5G. And what we do is give them that environment and that collaboration um, framework um, to start to understand where they sit um, you know, in, the, in the journey um, and also how they can develop their capabilities further. So the impact that we're driving um, is to, of course, grow the 5G ecosystem, you know, grow the supply side of these technologies um, and really uh, bridge the gap between the industry um, demand and also the SMEs are really looking for opportunities to add value to a lot of these use cases as well. Um, and you know what we're really interested in is how 
you know, different technologies also converge and work together um, in different stacks. And we think that, you know, 5G is, of course, a key enabler um, in this. So that's kind of you know, our key strategy in supporting SMEs on their journey. That's a lot of great stuff you guys doing. Um, and, and thanks for also uh, referring to 5G capability. Let, let's pick up this one. Ricardo, if I can come back to you. You mentioned difficulties and we talked about SMEs, you know, with CAPT, SIVA, um, and certainly you have a lot of experience advising manufacturers, understanding 5G um, to SMEs about the capabilities of 5G. Um, so, but, but what is really important to the manufacturers? Well, maybe we should turn that around and say what's not important to manufacturers. <laughs> maybe start that way. Um, I think it's not necessarily important to them if it's an N77 or an N78 or what type of modem it is or generally about network technology. Um, the manufacturers I've spoken to is like, does it work? Can I put it in? What does it do for me? That's really important. Secret. Um, they sometimes don't even care if it's 5G or a different network technology. I mean, it needs to work. It needs to deliver what they want to do. Yeah, that is that is the first important thing. So that we mentioned the use cases, all of us mentioned use cases. How does it help me run my machines more efficiently? How can I put more out in a better quality? How can I reduce waste in process? All these manufacturing issues, this is what is important to manufacturers. Can I measure the output? Can I measure my KPIs? Can I improve my KPIs? Is the return on investment correctly? Because we also have upfront investment when we're talking about 5G networks. The money that I'm putting in, do I get that out in the end or more? So um, there are quite a few different things. Also, um, again, coming back to the, to the, to the language like, like Siva picked up, um, do people understand me? And we're also having to look at, when we're talking about manufacturers, I very much make the distinction between talking about SMEs and talking about big scale manufacturers because big scale manufacturers just have much more resources and also in-house capabilities that SMEs just don't have, especially on the S side. Um, and there are lots of them in the UK, like most manufacturers on the S, maybe on the M side. So really understanding how we can help them and make a difference in a way that is tangible for them I think that's if we, if we pick that up and we can package it into something that we can deliver in a simple and easy but very impactful way, I think then we have we've cracked it. That's really the most important thing. Sorry, that was a bit plain, but I hope that that makes it clear. That's very insightful. So indeed, language easy, easy, easy of integration, return on investment. Uh, we, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, but on that capability aspect, um, um, can I pick uh, Joachim? Um, so you are certainly heavily involved in the fight to technology research and tries and, and you are expert uh, enabling those technologies. Um, perhaps, um, do you agree with, with uh, Ricardo? And, and also, can you, could you give some examples of the key fight to capabilities, especially designed to address the key points of the manufacturing in particular? Yes, I can. Um, so, um, I mean, first I agree, in the end it is about, do you solve the problem that you want to solve? It's the, uh, do you create the value? Do you achieve the uh, the target in the manufacturing that you want to have? This is what counts. And the technology below, if you can, I mean, you want to hide this as much as possible. Um, but then of course, in order to make this work, the technology has to do certain things and needs to work. And what I think are some of the key capabilities that really 5G brings to the table and needs to bring to the table uh, to make this work is first, I mean, we need dedicated private 5G network services for industrial customers. And um, they need to provide security, privacy, high availability and guaranteed performance. Um, so this is uh, something different from the how we use mobile networks in the past when you use your smartphone and walk around somewhere. I mean, it's a different level of how you want to uh, put them in place. And uh, for these dedicated private 5G network services, I mean, the standard has defined these so-called non-public networks, the capabilities to deploy and configure a network for having isolated guaranteed uh, services to an um, industrial customer. 
So I think that is one key capability. Um, then for the uh, for this seamless working and integration of 5G, the integration with what is already there, the industrial communication infrastructure, that is quite important. And this is in particular Ethernet with support for virtual LANs, um, time-sensitive networking for real-time Ethernet communication of the future, and also support of time synchronization. So these are technical key features which um, play a role. And then what 5G has to provide is to provide multi-service communication capability. Not everything is ultra-reliable, low latency communication. It's a mix. You want to, you don't want 10 different networking technologies for every single service. You want to have one uh, technology that can cover the quality of service um, range and support the different devices and the different communication demands. But then, of course, the deterministic time-critical communication with ultra-reliable low latency communication is one of the key uh, capabilities that comes with 5G. And then with that, the, um, um, it's needed to provide the, um, uh, the infra or the devices and the equipment on the shop floor um, with access to an edge cloud infrastructure. So I think that is what you in the end want to do in order to um, enable all the values that comes with these new computing paradigms. Yeah, excellent. Three aspects, right? So the uh, dedicated 5G network, um, guaranteed quality service and the device connectivity uh, directly with edge computing. So that seemed to be like end-to-end -end capability that we're looking for. Um, so um, can I also pick um, a follow-on question uh, with you, Yahim, in terms sure. of the availability, in particular TSN, and you, you yourself has has authored several technical paper on that aspect, TSN. So what, what is the availability of, of TSN devices or, or network? Well, TSN is um, um, well. It's a, a TSN is basically a, um, a set of features, and um, uh, so so there's not the one single TSN solution. And um, at the moment, I, I think on the fixed connectivity, it's um, there's still a lot of legacy of different field bus technologies, different real-time Ethernet variants, which are proprietary to a certain segment. Uh, but I think there's a, a common um, understanding in the industry that this diversity of technologies need to uh, converge to um, a common open standard, and this is TSN going to be. But the introduction of TSN is still at, in the early steps. Um, uh, but then at the same time, it's not possible to uh, to create dedicated solutions of interworking with 5G with all field bus technologies. I mean, that is um, uh, too much customization. I mean, it's in particular getting rid of this diversity and uh, uh, that, that is so important and that is why what was the big drive of TSN of saying we have an open standard Ethernet that is well established and I mean that is the standard and now adding the capabilities that so far were done with dedicated technologies to this, this is um, what TSN has done. So, but uh, I mean from the market introduction it's still, um, I mean um, the standards are ready but then it's a slow moving industry so I mean it's now that the introduction into the market is really starting. That's really interesting. Thanks uh, uh, for the bonus question. Um, so next, um, uh, so Joachim mentioned, you know, we, we talked slightly about uh, the availability. Uh, Siva, you've been working hands-on uh, in the factory future and other projects. So on this availability topic, what do you see are still missing? Um, a a follow-on topic could be uh, one of the unique use cases we are looking at is um, ultra low latency closed loop control of machining operations. So this is like this this a technical challenge even with the wired networks to do everything like um, so what technically what we're trying to do we're trying to take away the intelligence from the machine itself and then move it into a powerful scalable platform like. Um, you know, uh, so any any kind of a um, cloud platform or any kind of a big server rack. So instead of having the intelligence in the machine, we want to move it. It opens up a scalability. Um, you know, it, it breaks the scalability barrier as well as skill set barrier. So previously, people who can only trained in machines, they develop the algorithm. Now you can get somebody 
doing computer sciences with mathematics, they can look into the same problem. So it, it's, a, it's a big change for us if we manage to do that. But there is a technical challenge here. We need to get the full circle within several milliseconds. So to do that, what we're doing now is like we, we, try, we, we try different options. One, get any and every possible commercially available 5G gateways and all of them, and then daisy chain them to get those machines connected with all kind of protocol Joshi explained. The, the, the real difficulty is like every device getting into the pipeline adds more latency. So it is, it is difficult for us. So what we've done now, so we, we started from scratch. We started to build our own kind of device that's got all field bus technologies and 5G in one platform. So you don't need to have different, different modules in a, in, a, in a pipeline, everything in one memory, memory bus. So that, that's something we are trying. So this, there's, there's a gap here. So we, we, can't, we can't immediately get rid of these field bus technologies. It's, it's going to take time because they've been there for hundreds of years and then they are actually churning money. So we, we won't be able to change them straight away. So we've got to live with those um, field bus technologies. And then eventually, if, if it's going to be a transformation, that's great. Yeah, that, that'll be fantastic. So I think we are trying to take in smaller steps now. So if, if we connect those machines with uh, some flexible, small compute, you know, so you can call it edge, um, edge close to the machine, and then you process it there. And then there is a, there's a big, powerful, um, you know, cluster within the building. That's another level of edge. And then you are talking about, um, you know, IBM Watson or Amazon or whatever. And then we are measuring the latency between our building to the data center in London or data center in, you know, um, somewhere some somewhere up north. So it. It's, it's a complicated problem. Um, and then I, I, I think we are still in the infancy about 5G devices. We can't find lots of devices at, at this stage. And then even if you manage to find the devices, there's lots of things to fiddle with. Um, you know, you've got to configure, you've got to configure the you know, modems and then some networks, they work, some networks, they don't work. And then the bandwidth problem and all of them. So I think we are still exploring lots of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg problem. Without manufacturers telling the, the demand to their you know, uh, equipment vendors like Ericsson on, uh, or Nokia or whoever, um, then they won't make it. Uh, they won't make the right parts. But without having the right parts, um, the right components, manufacturers will not pick it up easily. So it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a you know, transformation period but I think it, UK is kind of doing quite well in stimulating the interest. And then at least everyone now knows there is uh, some opportunity in 5G and the people are trying, starting to onboard the technology. We're not waiting for somebody else to solve the problem for us. We are trying to at least identify the problems. Uh, we, we, if, as long as everything exposed, then you know, somebody will, and the new businesses will start to address this. And then this uh, open RAN concept is really cool. you know. If if it's if it's gonna if it's gonna really materialize, that'll be that'll be ideal. Um, but I think we've got to wait and see how it's gonna pan out. Definitely will work, but how long it's gonna take, um, you know, how 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 quick we can accelerate this, that's the that's the challenge we need to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, that that's a um, brilliant insight. Um, you know, 4G took 10 years to get uh, you know, adopt um, massive adoption, right? Uh, 5G, we're in second year, third year now. Um, so we're on that so ramping up curve, I would uh, imagine. Um, so, so Cathy, um, Siva mentioned uh, device availability. That's a, one of the key challenges, certainly in the first couple of years of 5G um, commercialization. Um, presumably that would be also the case for the SMEs as well. What other has uh, challenges uh, SMEs facing adopting 5G and what are the opportunities there as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess the first challenge really is um, an understanding of the business value. Um, as you know, startups and SMEs are usually you know, cash poor, time poor. They have you know, resource commitments to really maintain you know, their current 
uh, development roadmap, the current kind of business plan. So are they seeing enough demand um, in industry to really justify the investment and resources that they will put in to um, exploring 5G and experimenting with 5G? So that's kind of the first barrier that you face um, is really articulating, you know, the same way that industry measures ROI for the startups and SMEs, you know, how can they benefit from this? So that's the first um, challenge, I would say. And then, um, you know, something I've mentioned earlier around knowledge of 5G, um, 5G kind of features and capabilities, where do they start? Is it relevant for them? Or they are starting too early? Um, and then also just sometimes a lack of in-house technical expertise specifically related to network technology um, is also often a massive hindrance um, to them getting started on the, on the journey. So in terms of opportunity, of course, you know, if you want to get ahead of the curve um, and really, you know, uh, increase your competitive advantage, you know, that's something that SMEs do consider um, if they have the resources available. And I suppose if you're operating in the right market as well, um, that you can see actually a growing demand um, for specific use cases. Um, another opportunity, of course, is it allows them to build in you know, new features and new capabilities in their products um, and removing a lot of the limitations that they might have previously faced, um, in particular related to, you know, speed, latency, amount of data they need to upload and download, but also any kind of specific environmental constraints. So it frees up a lot of their, you know, creativity in looking at what, are, what does a future product roadmap looks like. So that's a massive opportunity for SMEs and startups in particular. Um, and then another, uh, you know, opportunity could be, you know, how could they take advantage of new business models that could be enabled um, by 5G industry as well? You know, where do they see themselves? Um, and also, does that open up new partnerships? So, you know, on the industrial 5G test and trials projects um, that we, we coordinate, um, you know, a lot of the projects are working with SMEs. Um, so, you know, does that open up, you know, new partnership opportunities where, again, you know, if you are ahead of the curve, you know, you have that um, competitive advantage over SMEs that might not have um, explored with 5G before. So, you know, it's a balance. And I think, you know, it comes down to an assessment of business opportunity and business value. And I think that's what we're all trying to help all sides of industry and SMEs articulate and understand better. Yeah, so you certainly have a great role here, a key role here to, to glue the demand supply side, the technology provider and demand user side. Excellent. Uh, now we uh, we let's uh, let's do two more questions. Um, of course, when we talk about uh, 5G um, and also refer to what Joachim said, you know we have a two boxes, right? Export possibility, but in the box two box we also have other competing technology like Wi-Fi six. Um, so really, there are there are technology differences, but also a similarity. Um, but I want to focus on the benefits that uh, can bring to the manufacturers. Uh, Ricardo, you mentioned, you know, manufacturers don't really care what technology underlying, right? But uh, um, what, what do you guys think about uh, the benefits? Is there any difference in the benefits? Maybe I can go first. Um, I mean, from the life examples that we have, um, they might sound quite plain to some people, but an immediate benefit we had is like instant feedback. Rather than measuring something afterwards when it has gone wrong potentially, we can in process measure now, which may prevent something going wrong. Another thing is um, with one of our trialists, they had a lot of paperwork to go through. After every process, they even had rubber stamps, literally rubber stamps in their drawers, open the drawer, stamp, I have completed this process. Through the process of, of what we're doing, they've actually now a touch screen and they have their swipe card that they're using anyways to come into the building. Now they're signing off the process with a swipe card. This pack of paper has disappeared, which for them is an absolute significant improvement. And it's a hand-on improvement. Everybody understands the benefits of that. These are just two examples that I've seen immediately coming out of what we're doing. And there, there are loads more. That, that will come after that. Very interesting. And Joachim, you, you, you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, coming back to your question on Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is, of course, an important wireless technology and um, for sure it's going to be used. Um, I mean, well, the, uh, 
the limitations come a, come a bit, I mean, due to the fundamental limitations of using unlicensed wireless technologies, um, it is more difficult to uh, to achieve something like deterministic performance. And this is where, for example, the benefit of um, 5G with dedicated spectrum resources comes in that um, um, reliable deterministic performance can be provided even in this wireless system. And of course, it has uh, benefits when it comes to more mobility like mobile robots. But uh having said that still wi-fi i mean uh, everybody uses wi-fi so for for the right kind of service this wi-fi is an important technology that's very interesting anyone else to add um i will add something here so we've we've tested this uh 60 gigahertz uh y gig technology Surprisingly, it is delivering one gig bandwidth straight away out of the box. So um, it, it's quite interesting, you know, to find out what are the technology that's available. We've seen lots of companies still using, um, you know, um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, ultra wideband connections. Um, some of them even use some, you know, unlicensed some internal frequencies for different things. Um, so it's in theory, they all can be standardized to 5G, something like 5G and, you know, a kind of a coordinated communication, that, that's possible. But um, as, as Ricardo mentioned, there, there are a number of steps before everything can happen. So there is a transformation process. First of all, we need to get the sensors connected into some kind of, um, you know, IP medium. So the, if this is not there, then you can't transfer into neither of those um, uh, 5G or something. This is, so we are working with uh, about like uh, 100, 200 SMEs in the regions in digital transformation. Most of this is nothing to do with 5G. This is mostly about connecting the systems. Um, um, you know, as you mentioned, Ricardo, the changing the paper base, the paper travelers. Can we get rid of them? Can we can we have a digital card traveling, you know, in the cloud while the things are moving? And also connecting, censoring up processes, uh, and then creating dashboards. So they all go hand in hand with this five uh, G journey because if five G is going to ad address the transport layer problem, so there are people they still haven't managed to that level yet. So they need to come up to that level. And then those who are already have a reasonable digital infrastructure, then they they can now get the benefits of AI and um, you know all, all kind of cloud cloud platform. So there's there is growth for everyone in in this uh, in this one. So there's no doubt five G is going to solve lots of things, even though it's it's at very early days and now the, the it, it is it is a significant technology. It is going to make changes, but. Um, Again, like um, the, the small steps that's going to happen now, they are quite important. I think they, they will also uh, have some impact on how 5G will be, or in what form the 5G is going to be adopted by the industries. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, indeed, that holistic approach and also the phased um, you know, approach, that's certainly going to move things uh, step by step. Um, now, um, we are almost come to the end of this session. Let me um, ask uh, everyone, everybody on this panel, uh, 30 minutes and um, 30 seconds rather, uh, what's your advice to the manufacturers who are considering adopting 5G? So we talked about, uh, you know, the easy integration, quality service, capabilities, values, etc. Um, so what's your insight to make those um, adoption easier for them? So 30 seconds, so let's start with Katie. All right, um, I'll try to keep to time. Um, so I think for me, of course, from the you know industrial 5G coordination and work that we've been doing, you know, learning from each other and really understanding what's worked in the past and what hasn't worked is key. So if you're you know um, thinking about um, your 5G journey, so really understanding what are some of the challenges that have been faced by industry and manufacturers and how have they gone around and solve you know different problems. Obviously, you know it takes time for a lot of the other challenges like you know availability of devices to be to be actually resolved but you can learn from you know how people have um 
overcome challenges with you know integration um, with existing networks and IT systems? How would you you know understand how to organize you know align internally as well between your IT, OT, and perhaps network technology experts? Um, cybersecurity is another topic that comes up a lot um, in terms of really anticipating um, the cyber um, security implications for um, you know different scenarios, um, and again just having a very clear idea on how you would like to measure um, the value of your uh, project or trial, how would you be measuring and calculating your internal investment? Because benefit realization, I think is, is a key thing that I think we need to consider from the very beginning. Um, and just another point to add, you know, there's of course a lot of the technical considerations, but at the same time thinking about um, business model innovation and how this changes your organization operations moving forward and how this can open up new collaboration opportunities is equally important from the business perspective. Yeah, so talk to Katie if you want to look into that. <laughs> uh, so Ricardo, what's your view? I was about to say that. Um, first of all, don't let yourself be thrown off by technical jargon. Yeah, there are lots of phrases out there and, and it's it can be, I mean, I started my 5G journey only in February. So um, you can get into it if you put, you put your mind to it. Secondly, go to people like Katie or go to the MTC or come to us. We have developed now what we call um, a productivity program where we really take manufacturers, as, as Siva said earlier, depending on which step of your digital journey you are, we pick you up at that step and move you forward. We don't do like one size fits all. We, we adjust to what you need. So search the help that's out there. Ask people the questions that is re are really relevant for you and, and don't be shy about it. Nobody, no, it's a new technology. Nobody is out there who's like an absolute super expert and, and can solve it all. It's, it's a team effort. Yeah, again, talk to Ricardo as well, MTC, that's another one. <laughs> uh, Joachim? Yes, I think uh, what is important to understand is that, I mean, there are not new factories being built all the time. A lot of the transformation happens in brownfield deployments. And it is not like binary that you say, okay, next month I have to switch off everything. And then I go to 5G and TSN and Edge Cloud and so on. Um, but you have to, uh, I mean, things that work, even if it's uh, old field bus technology or so, it's running, so there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe it's a burden for adopting some of the new opportunities like Edge Cloud or so, and for that you would need to do a transformation, but you don't need to do this all in one go. You get a new machine, you start in a corner, you redefine a line, and that's where you get started. And then, I mean, from the, let's say, the, stand, the technology has done a lot, but from the establishment on the market and the ecosystem building, we are still in an early phase, which means try to uh, to partner with someone. You have to bring in different competences here. And so find your right partner and start small with some somewhere. And, um, and then you take the learnings and then you know, you make this uh, transformation gradually. I think this is an important approach to go and take the right partners for getting the learnings that you, that have been made at other places and help building the ecosystem. Absolutely. And uh, and also add to the toolbox is uh, by GCIA um, and Ericsson as well. <laughs> um, and last but not least, Siva. Um, my simple statement would be start now, don't wait. Um, the earlier we start, like, you know, even though we, you know, we're not getting every, everything ready and uh, everything on 5G, there are lots of things before that needs to happen before anyone can add up 5G, like, you know, connecting the machines, having the proper data architecture, all of these things, even though you, regardless you have five, you know, 500,000 investment to get the private 5G or not, regardless of those, um, all of these steps have to be done. Um, so if somebody doesn't have access to those kind of larger investment, a smaller company, somebody, a tier one, they do have access to this. They, they had to do all of these steps. Maybe at this stage, if you, if you, if you, if you start, you know, thinking about how 5G is going to integrate uh, and then what are the, you know, how do you connect the machine? What is your final data architecture look, going to look like? They don't cost a lot of money. When you've done all of these steps, 5G might be ready for you and in an affordable price range. So um, I think it's really important to go and talk to all of these um, accelerator programs, you know, uh, SMSs programs. And I think there, there's a lot of support uh, across UK through RTOs, 
um, in a way, it's in all, you know, all kind of programs. They, 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 they should be accessing those. And then earlier we on board the journey, we can have. Yeah, that's absolutely great. Um, and, um, you know, Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, you guys also do great stuff um, um, enabling the SMEs or 200 animations. So that's, that's in, in, indeed very impressive. Um, so that comes to the end of this panel session. Uh, it's really great uh, to, to, to hear your uh, latest insights and uh, the recommendations in particular. Uh, for for the um, in particular SMEs and also you know how things are, are needed to enable manufacturing adoption. So yeah, that's a, a fantastic discussion. Um, and I, I guess uh, you know people know who to talk to now um, on this panel for further you know exploring discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank Fai G Word for for this session and also thank you um, Ricardo, Joachim, Katy, and Siva. Thank you very much.